Don't cross the streams. Why? It would be bad. I'm fuzzy on the whole good bad thing. What do you mean bad? Try to imagine all life as you know it stopping instantaneously and every molecule in your body exploding at the speed of light. Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes. Going to go back on the Wayback Machine, talk about Malibu comics, some other things with some some people that, that started out there, know the history of the company. A lot of interesting things happened at Malibu Comics. They essentially, uh, they had the Ultraverse line. Of course, Men in Black kind of came out of one of their, uh, one of their uh, extra lines, ended up being a movie. They also were the publisher of Record for Image for a couple of years. Did a lot of creator-owned stuff, kind of started small, grew bigger. Decided to get in the video game industry. That maybe didn't work out so well. <laughs> but here to talk with me about that is uh, my good friends Aaron Lepresti. He's your public enemy number one now. You're worse than <laughs> Spider-Man. That, that's my that's my understanding. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I, every time I go in the post office, I'm looking for like the poster on the wall. Uh, so. <laughs> so we're gonna, also going to talk about your Wraith of God uh, Indiegogo campaign that's doing very well. Already fully funded. I think you've got over 60,000 in less than a week, likely to hit well over 100,000. So congratulations on that. Sweet. Big success. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. It's, it's also, come with, uh, it's come with some, it. some uh, war wounds, but uh, <laughs> hey, there's little collateral damage. Never hurt That's anybody, right? right? <laughs> also with us is editor extraordinaire. Of course, was a writer also, I believe, uh, during his Malibu time. The man behind Silverlight Comics, Roland. Man, how you doing, Roland? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I get to talk about Aaron now, right? Absolutely. We want to hear all the dirt yeah. that Aaron right. on Aaron Ford is about. I had days. to be nice to him when I was the when I was an editor editor, right? That was my that was the was that was job. the edict from on high. Don't make Aaron mad. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. That's right. Boy, they I was so pampered, boy, they just like let me do anything I wanted. Actually I was doing pretty well, so Yes. Yeah. So Malibu actually had a lot of pretty well-known established creators. We had Jim Starlin doing work there, Gil Kane, Marv Wolfman, Howard Shakin, Walt Simonson, Barry Windsor Smith. But there was also a lot of uh, good new creative talent, one being Aaron Lepresti. Mm. What did you th- What were your thoughts about Malibu at the time, Roland, was you were an editor? Like, was it a place for new talent to be discovered, like get them ready for Marvel and DC? Or did, or did Malibu actually have uh, eyes on a bigger prize, maybe to be like that third competitor? Oh, absolutely, yeah. We... we um um, it was, it was so, so yes to both your uh, questions. It, it very much was a place for a uh, new talent to, um, uh, to make their way into the industry, but it was also, uh, Malibu had their sights set on competing with, uh, uh, Marvel and DC. I mean, that was the, that was the idea behind the Ultraverse is that, Hey, we're going to create, um, this whole line that can compete uh, of course, Image was, you know, still pretty hot at the time, and and uh, you know, Aaron probably remembers this. One of the things that about Image was they promoted it as Image is everything because it was always it was about the uh, the hot artist, you know, the seven founders mm-hmm. who they were all superstar artists, and uh, so you know, Image is everything. Well, when the Ultraverse came around, it was very story driven, so it was a very writer driven uh, universe. Um, but yeah, the, the, the goal was always kind of let's compete with these guys. We're not looking to compete with the smaller guys, right? We're looking to compete with the bigger guys. Well, that was, I, that was, that was pretty obvious when, you know, you guys actually had an actual television commercial campaign, yeah. like an MTV and stuff. I mean, you guys were, you guys were, were ready to go for it and be a major, major player in the industry. Yeah. And that was pretty it's obvious. crazy. Not even DC and Marvel today can really, with their marketing budgets, can even afford a commercial on MTV. Yeah. And you know, uh, you, you really do have to give uh, a tip of the hat to our marketing department at the time. Uh, you, you know, Wes, have you ever heard about the uh, the bus benches, the Ultraverse bus benches? No. Nah. So, so uh, I, I know Aaron's probably heard this story a yeah. dozen times, but but um, Malibu uh, purchased these butch, bu- bus benches, right? So you sit down on a bench, and the back of the the bench mm-hmm. has an an ad on it. Well, in, in their guerrilla marketing plan, they figured out where the uh, DC and Marvel offices exited onto the street, 
and they purchased those benches. So <laughs> as the Marvel employees left the building, they stared right at an Ultraverse ad on a bus bench. As the DC employees exited the building, they stared right at an Ultraverse ad on a bus bench. They had to see it every, I think it was probably for about a month, but they had to see it every single day for about a month. Now, who would have thought of that? I wouldn't have thought of that. I would just like, bus benches are cool. Let's do them. But they found out the location <laughs> where Marvel and DC had to stare at it every day when they left the building. That's so was that, you know, great. like a psyop where they're trying to get in their heads or were they maybe trying to poach some talent? A little oh, bit of it, well, I'm sure, I'm sure there was a little bit of both. It was a kind of a, kind of a little poke. Say, Hey, look, we're here. You got to pay attention. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a little, kind of a little, <laughs> kind of, you know, going mm -hmm. on. <laughs> That's pretty. And Roland, obviously, you were an editor. What was like the line there? You had a shared uh, universe. There were several universes under Malibu. We'll talk about the Ultraverse. What is it? You know, we we have. It doesn't feel like there's any continuity nowadays, really, with DC or Marvel because they've gotten so enormous. There's too many titles. Was it a nice, you know, cohesive universe where the editors are all talking to each other, make sure everything is cohesive? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the uh, the the Ultraverse was very much that way. And, and in fact, we had, and I don't remember the 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 frequency, but we had um, uh, founders meetings that were where we would bring the creative uh, teams in, uh, the writers uh, to coordinate kind of what writers and editors just kind of coordinate what was going to happen uh, in the future. Uh, all of the, the crossovers were were heavily uh, coordinated so that, you know, what would happen in, in, in this book would have an effect in the other book. Um, yeah, there was a lot of a lot of collaboration, um, a lot of communication. Hank, the the guy who, um, who who's a line editor of the Ultraverse, his office was right beside mine, and so it wasn't unusual that every day he and I are, and our doors were you know kind of bumped up together. He and I were just kind of walking back and forth, swapping notes and stuff like that, and it was really easy to do. So nice. So Aaron, obviously, this is kind of one of the places where you get your start in comic books. What's it like being discovered from Malibu? Did you have to send it a portfolio? Did they come to you? And what did they do to kind of help mold you into the Aaron Lepresti monster machine that you are today? <laughs> they, uh, you know, it's interesting because I was at, um, I had just kind of sort of broken in at Marvel. I was doing some Spider-Man backup stories and things like that. And I was actually at Dragon Con. And I was sitting right next to Mark Bagley, and three, Spider-Man 365 had just come out, and I had done, I penciled and inked the, a recap of Spider-Man's origin story as a backup story in this 365. So, we're, you know, I was sitting next to him and signing what books and stuff came by, and, and uh, Tom Mason and Dave Ulbrich came up to me and, you know, looked at my stuff, and because uh, I, had, I had asked Dave this actually not too long ago, you know, how did you guys even know who I was or why did you come after me and all this kind of stuff? And he said, we didn't know who you were. We were just at cons looking for young talent that we could, you know, bring into this. And, and so they, they, so they came up and introduced themselves, saw my stuff and, you know, asked if I'd be interested. And I said, well, you know, I, you know, being one coming out of a commercial art background, you know, the, the motto was always, you know, never turn down any work. Always say yes and figure out how you're going to do it later. And uh, so they were, they were saying they had some big things coming up, but they didn't tell me what it was. And so they, you know, they said, hey, would you maybe be interested in doing a cover or something for us? I said, yeah, sure. So I did a Dinosaurs for Hire cover for Tom's book. And, and so I didn't think much of it beyond that. You know, I kept in contact or they kept in contact with me, but I was, you know, slowly kind of building up there at Marvel. But I had... Um, I guess it was just fortuitous timing, but I was making about $85 a page penciling at that point, right? And this was 1990, 91, right? And that was kind of their starting rate. And at, at the time, I think the published high rate, like if you were, you know, an A-lister, was $135 a page. <laughs> That's what Gil Kane was making? Now, I'm sure that Frank Miller and maybe John Byrne were probably doing a little better than that. But, <laughs> um, but that was sort of like the high end for your average A-list artist that wasn't a superstar or whatever, right? Was So I was at 85, which was their starting rate, or just maybe a little better than starting rate. And I had done some stuff, and I got offered She-Hulk. And so I was going to take over She-Hulk when Byrne was done. Well, um, John Romita Sr., who was the art director at the time, found out about it and just said, no, he can't take over She-Hulk. He's not ready yet. And he, 
and it pissed me off, but I think he was probably right, you know. Um, and uh, so they kind of pulled it out from underneath me. At a, so I was pissed. And about that time, uh, you know, it was either Dave or Chris or Tom, one of, I don't even remember who, contacted me and asked me if I'd be interested in um, working on their new line of books. And they sent me this, you know, all the character sheets that you guys had, you know, these different artists like Simonson and, you know, yeah, these guys that did the, the, the sort of design of the characters. And they sent them all over to me and, and with a pitch and what they were doing and blah, blah, blah. And, and so I, I kind of thought about it and, you know, I was thinking, gosh, so do I, you know, what do I do? Do I hang around at Marvel? Cause I, it wasn't like I, they totally got rid of me at Marvel. It was just like, no, you can't have She-Hulk. You're not ready, but they would have given me something else. But I don't know. At some point, I think I was talking to Chris Holm and I said, well, you know, what are we talking about page rate? And, I, and he goes, well, we'll pay you $135 a page. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's $50 a page more than Marvel's paying me. <laughs> I was like, where do I sign? You know? And, uh, yeah, which is really bizarre for me because I was looking back on it. I can't even remember why I made that decision other than just the money because I had spent my whole life wanting to break into comics, right? Like most of us, right? And 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 then got finally got in at Marvel after just really a very difficult um, break in process. And I finally was in at Marvel, was getting some opportunities. Why I would just leave, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for a startup now, company? But I think it was I, I, I think it was the money. I honestly yeah. do, and so. Uh, so was it love at first sight when you saw one of those characters where you're like, that's the one for me? Not really, no. So they wanted me to uh, – they had just got Norm Bravefogel, right? And Norm, mm -hmm. I think, did the same thing. They gave him like, just a ton of money, right, and a huge bonus or whatever to, to leave Batman. And you think, are you your freaking mind? You're going to leave Batman to do a new startup company? You know, but – you know, so I guess I wasn't the only one that was somehow mesmerized by all of this. And um, – uh, so we went to a New York show in, uh, it had to have been, let's see, Shelly was pregnant, so it had to have been early spring. And uh, so Malibu had the big booth there. It was at um, one of Fred Greenberg's shows, right, Roland? I don't know. Did you go to that one? Uh, the, big, the Big Apple Con? It was, well, no, it was in the, it was in the Javits Center, but it was before, it was like in that like kind of down the steps sort of uh, hall and um, I went to a couple, but I don't, I don't, I think I went to like you set up and you had your little yeah. uh, portfolio set out with all the different characters you were going to be doing. And they had, you know, you had signs up for prototype prime and hard case. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to do hard case hard because, case. They, because they were getting ready to launch. Right. They're only three months out or something from this big launch and three or four months out from this launch. And they're like, yeah, we really need you to do hard case. You know, we want you to, do, and I looked at it and I was like, I just didn't, didn't do anything for me. Right. And so I was flipping through the portfolio, flipping through the portfolio. And then I saw Kevin Nolan's character design for sludge. And I grabbed him and I said, I, I got to do this. He goes, that's not launched until October. He goes, we re this is you to make more money if you do hard case. And I was like, you know, it's a big, and he's true. It's right. I would have made a lot more. Yeah. And, but it was like just the whole concept, the whole, Oh, he's a Hollywood actor and he's going to, I just had zero appeal to me. And, um, and I was kept looking at that monster and going, I, and I, you know, I thought about it and I just kept coming back to Chris and Chris, I'm sorry. I, I, I got to do sludge. That's, that's the book for me. And, uh, so he said, he, re, you know, he's very disappointed. I remember <laughs> he's like, all right, okay, you can do sludge. We'll get someone else to do hard case. And of course I thought, I thought by the time sludge came out, cause they, they ran the Barry Smith thing in there, right? The rune thing. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, that's going to pump sales on this. I'm going to make a fortune on this. But, you know, the, the already the market was already heading down when I hit it. So I did okay. You know, I think I got a $6,000 royalty or something on Sludge Number 1, which, you know, I'd take that now. Right. But, um, <laughs> it wasn't the kind of money that was being made on those first that first wave of no. books. So, but, I you know, in terms of – it got me attention, though. Being on Sludge did get me attention in the industry, where I don't know if being on Hard Case and just another superhero book would have, you know, drawn the attention. And uh, oh, the one other thing I'll I'll because you it was a two tiered question. It was like where I was why I was able to blossom at at Malibu 
where when I was working at Marvel, I was under so much pressure. I'm mean, self-imposed pressure, right? Um, to do good work that I just was doing terrible work. And they kept going, and this whole process was like, oh, I don't think we can work with you, Aaron, anymore. You're just not getting it, right? And then I go, no, 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 please. I did some more samples. I'd send them in, and they go, okay, these are better. All right, we'll give you another shot. And then I would tank it again, right? Because I was just, every line I put down, I was like, oh, my gosh, what if that's wrong? You're overthinking you know? it. Over, Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so I got to Malibu, and these guys were like, yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, was just, I would just, I mean, it was literally like that. They just had, they treated me like they had so much confidence in me that mm -hmm. I was, you know, I was a newbie, but, and so it allowed me to sort of really grow very quickly because I, that all that pressure was gone yeah. and I could just draw. Off. And uh, so that, that really sort of, that environment really helped me be able to kind of get my stuff to what I consider sludge to be my first professional looking work mm -hmm. in the industry. Aaron, I don't know how. Excuse, pardon me for jumping in here, Wes. Uh, I don't know how much you've you've talked about this, and uh, if you don't want to talk about it, just yell. Yeah. But you know, Wes, Aaron had a lot of uh, additional crushers. Now he was working with Steve Gerber. Now I absolutely love Steve Gerber, so let's make no bones about that before I, I go any further, right? I I think uh, of all the writers I have ever worked with, Steve Gerber is probably the most brilliant of all of them. Okay. Yeah, he was really but, good. But uh, and he and he's like naturally just you know he it, it's all happening in his brain and so when he puts it down well, a lot of writers need kind of a draft and then re, you know a second yeah. draft and then here's the final thing right even even the the ones who've been doing it for a long time still need that Gerber was one of these guys who could just he could talk to you about it and I would spend you know hours on the phone with him talking about stuff right and he would it was just all in his brain but then when he wrote it it was all just top notch right. The problem was, <laughs> and and this is where uh, I, again, Aaron, if you don't want to talk about it, that you know, no, no. but 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 there were so many times where we didn't really have much to go on from Gerber, and it was like, okay, Aaron, you got to do this. So, or, and I don't even remember how it happened at first. It, I mean, Aaron may have said, "I got an idea. Let's just do this," right? And we're like. Go because we don't have anything from Gerber, right? Right. Now so I'm waiting I didn't on know. him to get the story out. Yes, yeah. right. A lot okay. of that pressure also went to to Aaron uh, as far as story goes. So it wasn't just um, just penciling, right? It, there was a lot of um, was a lot of writing. Um, yeah, there was a lot of other stuff, other pressures on him to to come up with some stories. It, it was funny because when I first met Gerber at that big Malibu. Uh, shindig we had you know the big press conference and everything where they announced all this stuff mm -hmm. we sat there and started talking about our vision for the book and within five minutes I realized that we were totally incompatible in terms of what we wanted to do with the character <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like oh man this is not going to work out and uh, but I you know I smiled and we kind of laughed Wait, five minutes and you understood what he said <laughs> well, maybe, it was, maybe it was 15. Um, but yeah, he wanted to write a crime book and I wanted to write a mon or I wanted to draw a monster book. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, so it started off okay because the first issue came in as the origin issue, all that stuff. The script was, it was great. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I, I did the first issue. And then the second issue we had uh, was uh, Bloodsport or what was that, that assassin's uh, name that we came up with. I think it was blood sport, blood something, right? Yeah. Everything had blood in it in the 90s, yeah. blood something. And uh, he was this hired assassin, and uh, he got tangled up with with uh, Sludge. And so, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> the third issue was coming up, and uh, we were like, uh, so what are we doing now? <laughs> <laughs> and this is when this is when the deadline stuff started mm -hmm. catching up with Steve. You know, the first two issues were there, and the third one was. And so I we we had a list of characters. I remember um, either Dan Danko or or uh, Chris faxed me back in the old days. Faxed me uh, a list of all the character names that you guys had come up with that you wanted right. to use in, in trademark, right? And one of them was Pumpkinhead. And I mm -hmm. said, I I said I don't know what you guys were plans with this, but I'm telling you, this is what I want to do with this. And uh, so they, they, they couldn't end up using Pumpkinhead because of the movie. Um, the horror movie, yeah. 
Yeah, and so it got changed to Lord Pumpkin, right? And this was D- Danko's character. Yeah, Danko, yeah. It had and been I, Danko. I, I called up Gerber, or, and I said, okay, why don't we do this? I said, why don't we use this character, this pumpkin-headed character? It'll be a great kind of horror thing. It ties in really well. And I didn't really necessarily have a concept for it, but that sort of got Steve rolling. Okay, okay, we'll do that. We'll do that. And um, so he made he made Lord Pumpkin this crime boss, right? Instead of a you know a pure monster character. So we got that script out of him, and I don't know how much I contributed at that point, other than just the idea. And we talked some ideas back and forth to kind of get his motor going, so we, he would produce something. And then that was it. I mean, that was it. So then we're sitting around waiting and waiting, and and the the big pressure you talk about pressure was the deadline was just going away, <sighs> and I had nothing to draw. And we, and that deadline was coming and it was coming. And I was talking to Ulm and I said, Chris, I said, you know, cause he was like, we don't have anything from Gerber yet. And blah, blah, blah. I said, just let me write the issue. Oh no, we, we can't do that. You know, this is Steve's book and blah, blah, blah. And so we just kept pushing it and kept pushing it. And it was like, they had nothing. And it was like, I said, Chris, if we do not have a script, this book is going to be late. So let me write the issue. And he said, all right, all right, all right. And so he said, just plot it. And then we'll have Gerber come in and do the script. Right. I said, fine. So I wrote basically the alligator man story, the alligator and the sewer man story in the um, fourth issue. And uh, did so the is that plot. like the Marvel method where you're, you basically yeah. draw the yeah. entire thing and then he adds in the text later? Yep. I came up and it was very Jack Kirby, Stan Lee, right? So I just, I came up with this whole thing. You know, I, I introduced my wife as a major character in the, the series. She was the, the report, ace reporter, Shelly Rogers. I was in it. I was the editor that she worked for, and we had to put a little romance on the side. And I think Gary <laughs> Hart was like one of the guys in the office uh, and had some lines. And I made her uncle, uh, Carl Kolshak, you know, the Night Stalker. And uh-huh. <laughs> uh, so we did this whole thing. And it was just basically an alligator in the sewer story that, you know. And then Gerber got it, and he just – turned it into whatever. And so we're like, okay, that works. We did it. Well, then it got worse. <laughs> <laughs> so the same thing happened. Issue five, Gerber's got nothing. They're pushing it. They're pushing it. They're pushing it. And I was like, I, I go to Chris, I go, Chris, Chris, we're running out of time. And of course he didn't want to take, it. and I understand he didn't want to take it from Gerber, but it's right. like, we, we had nothing. He was producing nothing. And so then I came up and I said, just let me write this, the whole thing. I said, let me write issue five, and then Gerber can get started on six, seven and eight. Mm-hmm. We can get back to the bottom. And so, but I had to have plot meetings with Gerber. So I became, we had this big conversation on the phone, right, that was very uncomfortable. Because, and I said, I said, Steve, I am not trying to take this book away from you. And he goes, well, I'm not going to let you take it away from me. And I go, well, I'm not trying to. I said, we're just trying to get it done, you know. And um <laughs> So we worked out a plot, and I think that was probably mostly me, six, seven, and eight. And we brought back Lord Pumpkin. I said, Peep, this is cool. Bring back Lord Pumpkin. Let's play up this crime angle. Let's do this whole thing. He's his crime boss and blah, blah, blah. And we can bring Bloodsport back in because now he gets hired by someone else to kill Lord Pumpkin and all this kind of stuff. And so Gerber's like, okay. So he starts working on that, right? And then I go back and – work on issue five, which was the Frankenstein issue, of course, because I wanted to do a monster book, right? I didn't care about that crime crap. So I would have like a scene where with the crime bosses, right, for one page so we didn't forget them because I knew they were coming back. And then we get to the monster stuff. And um, and I think Chris, you know, Chris wasn't sure. He wanted to let go of my hand yet and just let me do whatever. So he sort of, he, he kind of helped me write it and um, with, the, with the dialogue and stuff. And then I just then I drew issue five. So four and five, I plotted four completely. I co-plotted three, plotted four completely, plotted and dialogued five, co-plotted six, seven, and eight, and then um, and nine. And then he finally came up because he had the Bash Brothers. Remember that? They was like mm. I guess Gerber yeah. was a wrestling fan or something. <laughs> so he had these two little these twin guys who were they're basically wrestlers, right? And they right. were the Bash Brothers. And so we did that storyline and then he was, you know, I don't know, he quit or things were starting to head down south. So I did the final issue, which I wrote and drew myself, which was basically Sludge versus Prime in that big yeah. double sized flip book. And then that was, that was the end. So was that the end as Mal- Malibu was kind of folding up? Cause we know 
the the bubble kind of got to them. We also know that they were losing a lot of money with video games at the time, Roland. Or were, was there more Malibu work after that? Uh, so you mean after the cancellation of Sludge? Or mm-hmm. you know, I, I I think Sludge was probably one of the early cancellations. Uh, mm-hmm. Just because right. of the, obviously the problems that you've heard, there was a whole round of uh, uh, early cancellations for some of the some of the. Um, Books that weren't quite selling the numbers of Prime and and, um, and that was kind of in conjunction with the the nineties bubble pop. Yes. Like oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it wasn't because you know. Um, yeah. It was just because the industry was it exploded in the in the late eighties, and there was a lot of money in comics in the early nineties. I mean, a lot of money in comics, and then you know by by ninety three. You know, not well, probably ninety four. Well, Marvel declared bankruptcy in ninety four, right? And that was really when when things began to uh, uh, to to really tank. Um, so I, you know, what I I can't. I would have to look at a calendar to tell you exactly yeah. kind of where Sludge was in the whole schedule of uh, of cancellations. Uh, but I know that a couple of books went on a little bit longer uh, than others. Um, some of them, you know, were can't like Nightman, for instance, was canceled, uh, revamped, and relaunched. Um, but it didn't, it didn't do, it didn't do well in the relaunch either. So, so do you think yeah, Malibu would have had longer legs? You know, even with the with the implosion that happened with the comic books, if they hadn't started the video game kind of department, where they, I guess, they're no, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars, like, like no, I don't. Monthly. I actually don't think that. Uh, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't really don't think that had that much bearing on it. I, I will tell you. I, I will tell you my thought. I think Malibu would have had a lot longer legs if DC would have bought them. Um, uh, you, you know, Marvel which, bought Malibu because they didn't want DC to have a bigger market share. Yes, what I understand. That's exactly yeah. what it is. It has nothing to do with the coloring department, which is a rumor that you can still find widespread on. Oh, on the, the digital uh, coloring. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, Marvel hated it early on. They hated the digital coloring. Um, they kind of had to be convinced that it was that it was good, and, and ultimately they were, but uh, not uh, not early on. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, I, I think that Malibu would have had considerably longer legs had DC bought them because I think DC has, uh, you know, at least the companies at the time they had a longer vision than uh, than Marvel did. Marvel was just really we're just buying you to keep. We we don't know what to do with you. We're just buying you so that DC doesn't have you. Um, and, and I think DC, I mean, obviously look at their uh, commitment to, um, uh, Jim Lee's company, um, oh, Wildstorm, Wildstorm, look at their commitment to Wildstorm. You know, they, 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 they stuck with that for a long time. Milestone so I, I, had some, had a pretty Miles, decent run. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that, uh, I, I think that, um, they would have, st- I don't know that it would have lasted, f- f- you know, forever, but I think certainly it would have lasted much longer than it did had DC been the purchaser. I, I think that, uh, um, so I know we did the video game stuff, but I'll be honest with you, dude. This is the first time I've ever heard anyone saying, "Hey, the video games, you know, tanked your company." <laughs> it's like what? No, no. Uh, uh, although I was Dave, reading, they were losing upwards of hundreds of thousand dollars a, a month. Yeah, on the development. Dave Ulbrich, you, Dave Ulbrich points to the video game as being one of the killers. He thinks really, you know, because yeah. because uh, we weren't doing video. I mean, we got rid of the video game um, segment of the company. Um, eventually yeah, but they, they how, money, how much upfront money did it take though yeah did they that, get a lot of losses that I don't know um, yeah, I, 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 they came in with money and that was part mm-hmm. of I think part of yeah. it when when they came in they brought money to invest into the comic book side um, yeah. but I, I don't I don't you know I, I wasn't privy to that information so I really don't know uh, all those particulars yeah like I said Dave Olbrich I talked to him not too long ago um, actually on, on one of my live streams and that he, he pointed that as kind of the, the big thing that he thinks obviously the market, you know, right. What it was and that ultimately killed everything. But he felt, he felt like they could have got longer life out of Malibu had they not attached themselves to the video game because it was poorly run. And yes, it was, it, there was, you know, there's a lot of waste and I don't know if the guy was, was taking money that, to do stuff he couldn't deliver right i can't remember exactly what the scenario was but they you guys were bleeding money as a result of the uh yeah of that video game stuff so it didn't help the you know if you had a you know two million dollars and then suddenly only have one million because all that million dollars went into the video game and you get nothing out of it that you know 
Well, uh, I don't say this too often, but I also blame uh, I also blame uh, the the outrageous, stupid sums they paid Barry Windsor Smith. <laughs> Really? Jay Windsor Smith is oh a gem. Oh my gosh! Is that, when <laughs> when, I, when I heard him. that money, I'm like, dude, you, this is you, no way. We are not paying. Oh yes, we are. I'm like, why? I said we will never, ever, ever, ever make that money back. But we're not just investing in the comic book. We're, we're like, we have. Look, we've got Barry Windsor Smith, and I'm like, yeah, but. Do that many people care? I believe no. I was the only one. I was literally the only one in the office that said, that's just stupid. We shouldn't do that. We we should not pay that kind of money for Barry Windsor Smith because it's not, it's just not, we're not going to see the return. Uh, the What is it? The ROI, right? We're, we, we're not going to see that. It's not worth that. It wasn't and, worth and the prestige and of being okay, associated so, with Barry so hold, Windsor Smith? So hold on. Let me, let me re- rephrase that. I'm not trying to suggest that as an artist, he's not worth that. What no, I'm I trying don't. to, what I'm trying to suggest is that the money that we spent on those, we would never get back in sales. The production cost was too yes, high. Thank you. That's yeah. what I, that's what I was trying to suggest. I don't want somebody yeah. to come back and say, Oh, Roland said that Barry Windsor yeah. Smith wasn't worth it as an artist. No, no, no. That's not what I said. Your that's company wasn't big thing. enough. And the pub, you know, the publication wasn't going to warrant the kind of money no, you were spending there. No, Absolutely. not at all. Not well, at all. Well, and that's no. the thing too, because it was. Uh, it's not like it was Barry Smith, nineteen seventy-eight. You know what I mean? Right. Yes. Or even in the early eighties, when he had some steam, when he was at uh, um, Jim Shooter's. Uh, what was that? Valiant. Valiant. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And, and some steam that's there. Nice. I guess that was actually early, late eighties, early, yep, early nineties, mm-hmm. during the boom stuff. When he was, it was, it was post that. Yes. And, you know, he was still visible, but it's not like he was just coming off Weapon X. You know what I mean? It was right. so, it was more like the legend is Ben Smith, but do, does the modern comic audience really, is that going to drive sales? And yeah. I think we, we get in our minds as, as fans of really, really talented, great artists. And we don't, sometimes you don't think, clearly business-wise it's like right well, we can get so-and-so to do an alternate cover but if you actually look at the numbers you can say well we had to pay this guy this much money to do the alternate cover and it's going to give us very little bump and maybe none at all right you know and so then you're like okay yeah it makes us look good right but is well, that it- and it's the cool factor, you know, the cool factor. Ooh, cool we got you know a Barry Windsor Smith cover you know that's cool yeah. but cool doesn't <laughs> always you know generate dollars absolutely well, the accounting office has to have a say in this <laughs> that's right, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. it's a publishing yeah. attitude though you know that's yeah. been around for a long time i remember talking to i won't name who the artist was but i remember talking to dan DiDio at dc and they they uh they had somebody under contract but some that somebody wasn't doing anything you know wasn't producing anything and i'm like I just said, because I always would talk to these guys at DC from a businessman standpoint, like, you know, rather than an artist, I would always go, why are you paying so-and-so this much money and getting nothing out of them? Mm -hmm. And Dan said, because I would rather have them not working for us than not working for Marvel. (laughs) (laughs) For working for Marvel? Yeah. (laughs) So there is, there's a certain amount of clout, I think, that they think that, you know, in a bigger company like DC or Marvel, obviously they can absorb that better than yeah. a really small company like Malibu could. But there is some logic to that thinking, you know, but I think with Barry Smith, I think um, legend, sure, but the, his ship had pretty much sailed right. in terms of, yeah. you know, being someone that was going to sell a book for you. Right. Um, whereas, you know, the person that I was talking to with Dan Dio was very much someone that would have sold a book for you had he done any of the books <laughs> work. right yeah <laughs> and yeah. it gave him time to be able to say so and so is under exclusive contract with dc and then maybe right. no one would notice that they hadn't really done much <laughs> they, they didn't do anything yeah and again it's, it's it's not like i don't think that um that we couldn't have made money at some level but um the the amount that he was paid was just right. way too much and it was just like no 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 we'll, we'll never make that i mean we would you have, have to, to sell know. a lot of trades right end. i'm like look like you can half that and we'll yeah. still have problems but yeah. we might can you know we it might be attainable at half that rate but yeah. um but yeah uh, I was the lone dissenter in the office, and they were like, "Yeah, well, we're gonna do it anyway." I'm like, "Okay, fine, whatever." 
<laughs> so, nice. Aaron, what are your thoughts on, you know, obviously Marvel Comics owns Malibu and, and a lot of the IP. Are we ever going to see a Malibu revival or an <laughs> Ultraverse revival? Are we ever going to get a Slee Sludge in a comic book again? No. Um, I think Roland can probably speak to this um, <laughs> probably better than I than I could because um, <laughs> my... I wish they I, would just give you the character then. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, well, somebody that loves it. This, this is this is another dumb business decision, right? Because yeah. you like you have IPs sitting there, but you refuse to use them. Which you might be because, and Roland, correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that, and I'd have to go back. I, I can't even remember what the contract was. But all of us that like co-created some of these characters, we have like a bigger ownership. And I don't even know. It was like five percent. It wasn't like a huge amount of money, mm-hmm. right? Not, but. <clears throat> it's still bigger than what Marvel is paying anybody else, right? So if they use those characters, they got to pay the people that are attached to creating them, I mean, like all the writers, um, you know, some of us are- to honor the original contracts. Right, yes, exactly. So that means, like, for example, if, if they say they did Sludge, right? And I own, I think I own 5% of it, but I'm not, I can't remember exactly the number, right? But so- I have to go look at my tax returns from, uh, you know, 30 years 90, ago. 93, yeah, right? right. <laughs> the contract is stuffed in there. But so, and the, so they, they publish a book and let's say it may, and it wouldn't do this, but let's say it makes a hundred thousand dollars, right? Well, now they're into me for $5,000 bonus on top of the page rate. They have to pay me to draw it or whoever the, you pay, they wouldn't hire me, obviously, but they would hire someone to draw it and write it. They got to pay all those guys. And if Gerber was still alive, He's probably getting, if I'm getting 5%, he's probably getting 10 or something, right? And so now suddenly 15% off the top is going to these creators on a book that probably, you know, they're not going to make a ton of money on anyway. So so they will never see the light of day, ever. Um, and I think, Roland, is that fairly an accurate assessment, would you say? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, um, um, so I, I think I think your 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 numbers are probably right, and that is more than 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 what Marvel does. Um, now, I have I have not as large as yours, but I have one of those as well. Um, and I think I need to look at it again. So, my understanding is this, though: um, if they do a, a comic book, you don't get anything, right? That that's okay. that's separate from um, the, the agreement that you have um, because as we know there's not really enough uh, not really enough money in comics so you don't get, they can do a, a new comic book without you right and you don't get okay. anything okay. Um, however if they do toys and t-shirts and anything not a comic you get that money as the creator right so that's where that's where that comes in Anything at all that they do that's not a comic book, you get that. Um, so, so why would they invest in it? So they have to give some of their profits away if they end up being well, in a movie or something, right? You know, so so um, I, I'm not sure how much I can say. I know stuff that I'm not supposed to know. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't want you to give anything away. Well, then. So let me let me just put it this way. Let's see, let's see if I can strategically say it. Uh, uh, much of it has to do with personalities involved that they would have to deal with. Um, they would be re- Marvel would be required to deal with personalities. Uh, should they bring some of this? <laughs> yes, you do. You know exactly. Um, yeah. And and Marvel's just like, nope, we're not going to do it. Not going to happen. We don't want to deal with these personalities. So sorry, all of you other people. We don't. We don't want to do it. Um, yeah, so so there's more to it than that. It's it's really as as Aaron said, it's kind of stupid, right? Because it's not, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to some of the things they do. Um, you know, I've seen Tom Mason post, you know, it, it, uh, about reprinting the books. Well, they'd have to get the files and this and this and that. All of that stuff is is digital. So you know, all they got to do is find it. Um, it's Format. really if you've if you've dealt with digital stuff before, you know, it's really not that hard. You know, right. yeah, of course it takes some time, um, but you know, they could just put one person on that job. They said, look, it's your job to get all this stuff and fix it all up, and 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 you know, then they could reprint it, which I think they ought to reprint them in trades. 
Um, I, I don't know that uh, and, and they could do that as a test, right? They could do it as a, let's see, let's see how well these tests, these trades do. We collect these. Uh, do a you know, Kickstarter. Yeah. <laughs> see what happens. Don't, don't, you know what don't, I mean? don't tell Marvel to do a Kickstarter. Yeah, Stop can you it. Imagine? Can you Hush. imagine the blowback if they did oh, that? Oh, it worked for Boom. Yeah, it worked well, for Boom, but come on. But it allows them to gauge the interest. It. <laughs> and if there's not enough interest, they don't have to fulfill the campaign, right? Like yeah. it didn't make. Right. Yeah, don't fulfill it. Um, so, well, you know, it so another it thing. get the dollars. So another thing, okay, and here's what I here's what I've heard. Aaron, you probably heard this one too. Is that I've heard people say that that Marvel won't do it because the accounting is too complicated. Okay, because of the, the <laughs> contracts, like what Aaron mentioned, which those those are real, those exist, right? But here's the thing that that always makes me laugh. It's like Malibu had an accounting department of three. Okay. Yeah. Disney's that was our big account. accounting com- accounting. They department. got a huge accounting department, right? They got Are contracts on the world. Me? Are you <laughs> telling me that that this accounting department of three was smarter than Marvel's accounting department, and they couldn't figure it out? If our accounting department could figure it out, of three, <laughs> you telling me that corporate Marvel accounting can't figure that out? Yeah, that's that's yeah. I, I'm sorry, I don't believe that for the least little minute. Um, so yeah, they're just, um, it, it, you know, and uh, Joe was asked before, um, and he s- said something about the numbers, but you know, that's, that's, um, that's just, well, dodging, you know, that's dodging. They don't, they won't, they don't want to deal with personalities. <laughs> I'm going to remain hopeful that maybe one day we'll finally get at least, at least some reprints, hopefully a reintroduction of the Ultraverse and some of these other characters that that they bought for well, it appears to be no reason other than for not DC comics to have them. Yeah. So I would love to it. see some some trades and compilations and <laughs> omnibuses. I, I would love to see that. I think that would be fantastic. If there are there are viewers out here that would love to meet you in person and talk about Malibu comics, maybe some of the other <laughs> stuff you've done, or maybe Silverline. Yeah, I know you are going to be at Daytona Beach Comic Con. Can you That's give right. the viewers a, a few of the details on this? Absolutely, Daytona Beach Comic Con, in my opinion, is one of the best comic book shows in the area. Now, I know there's a great big box uh, 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 behemoth. Comic Con in the Orlando area, but it's not a Comic Con. It's a Media Con, right? Uh, Orlando Comic Con is a Comic Con. If you like comics, this is where you ought to go. Superline will be there. We'll, there'll be about uh, ten of us there, uh, and so we're going to have us a, 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 a small little boothish area. It's not really a full booth, but it's like a half a one, right? And uh, so you can come there and, and buy some uh, comic books and get some autographs and get some sketches. Well, there'll be a couple of artists there and talk to us about Silverline. And you can ask me any question you want to about uh, Malibu. I'll mention names off air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, uh, but yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a lot of fun. There's a, a, a lot of other uh, creators that will be comic book people that'll be there as well. But uh, uh, Silverline, who's uh, I'm worried about, right? So yeah, come on out. And, uh, it's, a, it's a two day show in Daytona. In Day- Well, it's not actually in Daytona. It's just south and west of Daytona in a, a little place called DeLand, but it's still Daytona Beach Comic Con. So you're close enough nice. to the beach. You can come buy some comics, then go hang out on the beach. I know you've got a couple of, of new crowdfunding campaigns you can't spill the beans about, but if people want to stay informed, where, where can they go? Is there a, a mailing list? Should they go to an official Twitter page? Is there a Facebook page? Where can they find these details when they do? All of do the release? above. Uh, we, okay. we, we've got it. Silverline's got a website, uh, silverlinecomics.com. We've got an official Twitter. Uh, we have an official Facebook page. We also have an email list that uh, if you're on the email list, you'll sometimes get a, a 24 hour advance notice of things before uh, the general public does. We try to we try to let the folks on our email list know things in advance um, a little bit so that they can they can be ready. Um, instead of when we launch a Kickstarter, we just make the announcement. Um you know, to the to the to the world, but those on our email list, we try to give a little bit of a of an advance notice so that they can. You know, there's only so many. When you have original art, uh, there's only one of those, and so those who are on our email list, we try to say, look, if you, this is a page you want, then you're going to have to act fast because uh, you know we we launch tomorrow at noon or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, all the above uh, is where you can where you can find all the news. Awesome. There will definitely be links in the video description now, Aaron. You yes. have, you've got a, a campaign going on right now, Wraith of God. Yeah, rocking. Uh, super duper, uh, you know, uh, successful. You've already met your goal, exceeded it by a whole lot. It's come with it a little bit of controversy. You've been under the fire, but you've handled it well. 
It looks like yeah. the, the campaign is going to be a mammoth success. What can you tell us about Wrath of God? And if people want to support it on Indiegogo exclusively, I believe, how yes. can they do that? Well, um, <clears throat> I wish I had the little, uh, you know, you spend so much time trying to, like when you're doing a pitch, right? And Roland knows this as well, yeah. that you have to, you got, oh, I got this story. It's this long. Now I got to do this so I can get it out in like 30 seconds and pitch it to somebody so they can, you know, understand what I'm talking about. So I have one of those, but it's, I, I don't have it written down in front of me, but basically it's, um, it takes place in 1883 and we have this sort of, uh, um, superhero character called called the Wraith and he is um, kind of a Batman of the Old West um, master of disguise master of illusion um, he has a he has a partner uh, named Esther who is a former Salvation Army worker that he's sort of um, enlisted to be his Alfred if you will and uh, they have a very sort of um, tenuous relationship but during the, this whole process, there he's basically a monster hunter, right? He believes he's kind of on a mission from God to quote the Blues Brothers to kind of wipe out the, this this um, supernatural evil that's that's in, encroaching on the land, right? And so the uh, there's a European monster hunter retired who has this amulet that um, and he's hiding out in like this small town called Calamity, Arizona, right, in 1883, because this amulet is, is, if a werewolf gets possession of this amulet, they become invincible. Silver bullets don't work, you can't kill them while it's in their possession, right? So you got these werewolves that want the amulet, and the Wraith and Esther are trying to stop these werewolves from getting the amulet, and we don't really know who all the, we don't know who the werewolves are, all and we don't know uh we don't know the the wraith is a very mysterious character with a dark past and you get um it's very sort of ambiguous for a lot of the time is this guy nuts is he really this uh you know supernatural being that that that, that god is sent to, to destroy this evil or is he just nuts and you know esther is like the sort of the 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 calming for or the the rational force and all this trying to figure this out from the inside you know is she doing the right thing is this guy really who he says he is you know and so you're dealing with all this kind of stuff while you're trying to you know track these werewolves and stop them from gaining this amulet and uh, so it's a lot of fun it has a lot of elements that I like obviously it's got the monsters which I enjoy drawing it has it has a superhero element to it um, and but then I it's you know it's a western in the sense that that's the landscape that it's set in, you know, that's the time period. Um, and so it, it, to me is artistically, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging me to get to do stuff that I, you wouldn't normally do in a regular comic book. I mean, most of my work has either been monster books or superhero books and this a straight superhero, you know, Superman flying people, you know, buildings, tumbling, all that kind of stuff, but to actually go in and be able to draw the old West and, the type of characters you might see in a Sergio Leone movie, you know, is really appealing to me and really intriguing to me. So it's, uh, I think it has a little bit of every everything for everybody. <clears throat> and oh, sounds, I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say you can back it by, um, I don't know. Do we? You'll probably have a link in the absolutely. The There'll be a link in the video description. Yeah. And, so uh, it's it's live right now. It's been live for five days. It's uh, been trending really really good. Um, you know, we opened in the first less than 24 hours got to $30,000. Uh, and um, uh, so it's right now, I think it's pushing 60. So with less, we haven't even, it hasn't even been a week yet. So uh, we're real pleased and very happy with all the support we've been getting and um, we hope that it continues. And the people that, you know, see this will at least go and check out the options on the, uh, the launch page or the, the uh, campaign page. Hey, I get, paid, I get paid Friday. When does it close? Oh, it's yeah. we're like another three 21 weeks. Days, twenty one <laughs> days away. So. Twenty one days. Okay, good. I'm, I'm in good shape. <laughs> so, Aaron, I do want to say congratulations on the success. Yeah. I think a lot of people have probably seen that there are people out there attacking your character because they don't agree with the way that you've promoted your book or a platform that was available to you that you went out there and, and got the word out there. I'm completely in favor of what you did. It's your mm -hmm. it's your comic book. I think you should be able to market it the way that you want to to find your customers. Roland, I, I think you've probably seen what's been said about Aaron lately. You I know him, been. obviously, better than I yeah. do. Uh, you've had a personal relationship. What did you think about the words that people were trying to use to describe it? 
You know, I I I I posted something on on their Facebook page and, and just said, you know, all, all these people who are 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 posting these negative things about Aaron, they are haters. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I I could probably think of some worse words I can think of them, uh, I, but I won't say them. Um, like I said, I, I've I've known Aaron uh, for a bunch of years, probably more than he and I wish to uh, confess. Um, but yeah, you know, Aaron's just one of these all around nice guys that um, and I, I can't remember if we were we were live when I said it. Um, but you know, I, I think this uh, this can the success of this campaign is phenomenal, and I think uh, you know, I think someone like Aaron deserves this success and i am i am so happy to see this happening for aaron because um yeah he's a super nice guy and anyone that says anything any different has just never met him um yeah thanks. so thanks i appreciate you saying that Roland. yeah absolutely um, <laughs> and, and i mean it so um, yeah, yeah so. I, I just i, I if think you're it's, one of those haters and you wanted to come here and say something rude about aaron you can go piss off we're not here for that we're here to celebrate the, the overwhelming success i think you've done a great job marketing the, the campaign looks like it's going to do probably more than you even anticipate and listen uh, job well done. I, i'm going to put words in aaron's mouth and he's going to correct me if i'm wrong <laughs> but here's 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 what I, I i think about aaron aaron's making a comic book that anyone can read. If if you voted for one party, you can read it. If you voted for the other party, you can read it. This is not a this is not a a a this is a comic book for entertainment. And I'm sorry, I know it's something larger, but I'm calling them comic books, right? This sure. is this is a comic book that anybody can read. This is not a comic book that flies a flag that says, "Oh, you know, you can't read it if you if you don't support this way." Um, you know, Aaron's been in entertainment for a long time, and he's making entertainment for a, a lot of people. So those people that are that are hollering and fussing and 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 carrying on, they're just you know, hollering and fussing and carrying on. And we, you know, my kids were hollering and fussing and carrying on. We just ignored them. And that's what I think we, you know, that's what I think we got to do with, with all these, these people that are, 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 and I know it's harder. It's easier for me to say than for Aaron to say, cause they're, they're saying things about him. And I, I think that's the, that's the worst thing out of all this is they're attacking his character, which is just, which is, you know, shows you what kind of people they are. Yeah. That's it, it. It was a, it was a surprise. You know, I, um, when launching it, I knew there there probably might be some controversy involved with the you know the platform I chose to to launch from, but um, I had you know I had no no idea it was going to be like this yeah. and just and how you can you know how you could how you suddenly take on the responsibility for the actions of other people that you have no control over and don't even know <laughs> yeah. remarkable to me you know I would I I um. I, I made this analogy on my live stream and a lot of people liked it and um, that you have a bunch of, and I, I, this is, this hits home for me because when I was in college, one of my favorite things when I was in California in college was going to Ralph's and getting um, cherry vanilla yogurt. And they had this store brand that was cherry vanilla yogurt and it was freaking awesome. In fact, once all of our roommates discovered it and we all carpooled to the grocery store, it was a mad dash <laughs> to the dairy section because it was never enough cherry vanilla for all of us, you know, so it'd be, we'd be fighting, literally fighting each other to get to the cherry vanilla. So you have this group of people that love cherry vanilla ice um, yogurt, right? So they say, you know what, why don't we form a cherry vanilla yogurt community and we can talk about how much we love cherry vanilla yogurt and everybody, you know, you got thousands of people become the cherry vanilla group, right? On, 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 uh, and then, but then a couple of these cherry vanilla guys, they go and they get into it with somebody else or they commit a crime or they do something horrible and they've hashtagged it cherry vanilla yogurt. And so now everybody's like, you have, you have to disband this cherry vanilla yogurt group because these two guys that also like cherry vanilla yogurt <laughs> said some horrible things and did these terrible things. And you're just as bad as they are because you eat cherry vanilla yogurt. And you're like, show me on. Show me on this doll where Aaron hurt you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. There are these people that are attacking me. I, I had one guy, you know, he had he had bought a copy of Garbage Man on uh, through Amazon, I guess, and he, he took a screenshot of how he refunded his money I and then put that. a meme of guy of a guy throwing a book at, and he said, you know, I can't support anybody that belongs to a hate group and and does this 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 and this right. And I, 
I just said, you know, obviously there's nothing I can say that's going to change your opinion. I said, but I have not experienced anything of what you're talking about. I don't know those three guys that used to eat cherry vanilla yogurt that are now in jail. You know, I don't know those people. I've never met those people. I am not responsible for the things they said and did. And to suggest that there's, you know, uh, obviously we're talking about comics gate, but to suggest that there is, there's not people that come and go with that hashtag, you know, there could be people that say, Hey, I just discovered this and now, yay, I'm comic skate or whatever. They had nothing to do with something that happened three years ago with a bunch of guys that or a few guys that went off the rails. Yeah. You know, you don't, it's the internet. You have no control over these people and what they do. There's a, everybody that I have come in contact with both professionally and as the fan base and the supporters have been super nice people. That they have done nothing to me except be positive. I don't get it, you know, and if I see someone get out of line like on my my live stream or something in the chats, I call them out for it and go, that, we, we don't do that here. That's not cool. And and I just, I just don't see it, you know, and I'm not saying there's not bad people out there. Obviously, there's bad people out there that are attacking me, but, <laughs> just, you know, just your average, you can't just lump everybody into this big category like there is not a president of the organization who can say, well, you know, number 556 said this to so-and-so, you're out. You know, that, that's not what it is. It's not a group. There's no membership cards. There's no, you know, mission statement. There's no, it's just, it's just people with like-minded, you know, comic book people that sort of get together on the internet once in a while for live streaming and to support, support books. It's not, yeah. it, you know, and I'll tell you, Aaron, I'm four. barely comfortable being responsible for my own actions because exactly. I know that I do stupid <laughs> stuff. I'm yeah. certainly not comfortable being responsible for your actions or Roland's actions nope. or anybody else's. And you shouldn't. My be. actions define who I am. Yeah. If I if I and go on Bill, if I go on Bill Maher's show, right? Because I want to promote my movie or something. Obviously, he wouldn't have me on to promote a comic book. But if if I was promoting a movie or something, maybe I don't even agree with Bill Maher at all. And anything he says, but I'm, I'm saying, you know what, this is a good a platform. They invited me on. I'm going to take advantage of it and Hold promote my balls. Do, yeah. do, am I not responsible for everything that Bill Maher ever said? No, no, no. he's grown no. up. He's responsible for himself. Well, yeah, you exactly. know, it goes back to what you're talking about business, right? This is a business. Um, yeah, of course we love comic books, but this is a business and you've got a product in Wraith of God that you are trying to get out and, and make people aware of. Right. And when you choose platforms, you say, Oh, look, here's a platform that has, I don't know how many, I don't know how many viewers he has, but it's a bunch, right? Here's, they've yeah. got a whole bunch of viewers. This is an opportunity for me to go on here and promote my product so that these people can see it and become aware of it. And, and yeah. then Aaron knows, yeah, go ahead. Ethan Van Skyver, you guys, you worked at the same company together. There's, uh, you know, yeah, Ethan's he offered Ethan, you an opportunity, right? Ethan's a guy I, you know, I've known superficially over the years. I'm just getting to know him right now, really, and uh, and I, and I, but I do know, you know, I know Art Tabear really well. Mm -hmm. I know Andy Smith really well. We worked at CrossGen together. Yeah, I know Graham Nolan Graham, pretty well yeah. because we went to. Uh, we got to know each other when we ended up on a trip to Europe together to promote some Batman stuff. I'm getting to know Dan Fraga, who I didn't know before, but just met. And uh, Billy Tucci, who I, I've yeah. known superficially for a while, but another great guy. So here I am doing this show with these guys. And they're all, you know, we're all comics gate. I mean, that's fine. You know, let me figure out what this is all about. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not in. I'm not saying I'm out. I'm just saying let's find out. So, and these guys all turn out to be really, really good guys. I've never good heard guys. of them you know, bad things about anybody except people that have said bad things about them, you know, which is, I guess, is a normal human reaction, right? You're, and so then, you know, I go on Ethan's show a couple times and, you know, they, it gets, <laughs> I just talked about this last time, like, dude, you know, you guys are too raunchy for me, you know, but, you know. They get raunchy. Yeah, and I was like, but that's, I get, that's your shtick and I understand that, you know, I'm not saying, don't, you know, change your show for me or anything. I'm just saying, understand that. You know, if I'm the guy sitting there not saying anything, it's because I can't participate in, you know, some of this stuff. But, and then, and then you look at the chats, right? What are people saying in the chats? And, you know, I'm looking for, where's the racism? Where's the misogynistic? You know, where's the, where's the anti-gay stuff? Where's all this stuff that they're being accused of? And I don't, I don't see any of it, yeah. right? And then those people start coming over to my live stream and they'll watch my live stream and stuff. And they're all very, you know, pleasant and they're all very well-mannered. And I'm like, I don't see 
all this this stuff that this hate group that this is supposed to be. So why wouldn't I associate with these guys based on if you took away if you took away the hashtag right and just said we're we're comic independent fans comic, yeah we're independent comic people there's <laughs> everybody I've come in contact with there has been you know. And I can't vouch for every single person's character in the world, obviously. I don't know what people do behind doors. But everything that I've seen and everything that we've been involved in in conversations and stuff like that, other than occasionally being critical of some stuff that's going on in mainstream comics that we don't like, but who doesn't right. do that? Right? I mean, Wes, that's your show, right? Is yeah. right? That's <laughs> what comic fans do every Wednesday and Tuesday. Right. It's exactly. right. Yeah. So, you know, so I see this. And I'm just like, you know, you're afraid at first because you're like, oh, I don't want to be associated with this hate group. But then you find out they're not a hate group and they're not really a group because there's no leader of the group per se, right? And so it's kind of like, and there's no organization to it. So it's like, these are just a bunch of people that, that dig comics. And if they want to, you know, if they want to hashtag Comicsgate, you know, that's fine. That's, that's, you know, so what? You know, it's just... It's just incredibly stupid. I've never seen anything like, I mean, I've seen it from afar, but I've never been involved in it like this. And you always kind of get the idea that, well, if some people are involved in that, they, they've done something to kind of stir the pot to get involved in that. And then suddenly you start finding out that, well, maybe they didn't, you know, maybe I, <laughs> yeah. it's like, I just did, you know, launched a book and I get up yeah. the next morning and it's like, I'm in the crosshairs, you know, I was going to get a t-shirt that said with a bullseye on it that said, throw tomatoes here, you know, yeah. I mean, it's just, yeah. We if know, it wasn't like, you that day, Aaron, it would have been whoever else they decided yeah, that's to, true. they were going right, to attack. True. It's just, I just got yeah. lucky, I guess. It's just, it's it's weird. It's like a, a sport nowadays with the, the advent of social media. So I do want to say thank you very much to Roland and Aaron for joining me today. Talk a little bit about history of Malibu comics. Aaron had some pretty funny stories working with Steve Gerber. Roland provided a little bit of perspective yeah. about Malibu, and we got some good stories out of there as well. And certainly uh, if you're going to be in Daytona Beach area, Definitely go to Daytona Beach Comic Con. Find that silver, uh, silver coin. I'm sorry, silver line. Silver line. <laughs> sorry, silver coin is uh, is that uh, Chips and Arsky, all those guys. Silver line comics booth. Go support the support those guys. Uh, meet Roland. Ask them some questions about Malibu comics. Definitely, yep. if you haven't checked out Wraith of God on Indiegogo, Aaron's campaign is live. I think it might be the one for you if you like monsters and westerns and all kinds of superhero stuff. It's probably a good campaign. Hey, and uh, you know. People are people were not treating him very nice. Give him a chance and see if the comic books for you. Yeah, that's right. Just yeah. just give us a chance. That's all we ask. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>